Hola, bienvenidos al amanecer. Somos Star Child, Cyber y Shockadélica y os damos la bienvenida a la cuarta temporada de Purple Music. Esperamos que os gusten los programas y contenidos que tenemos planteados para esta nueva etapa. Como siempre, realizaremos análisis de canciones y álbumes en nuestro podcast, charlaremos con otros fans y promotores de iniciativas relacionadas con Prince en nuestra sección de YouTube Parlor Games y os acercaremos al Prince, músico y persona, a través de entrevistas que realizaremos a artistas que trabajaron con él en diferentes épocas de su vida. Para empezar, hoy tenemos el placer de inaugurar la cuarta temporada con un invitado de lujo, ni más ni menos que Morris Hayes, músico que trabajó con Prince durante dos décadas, lo que le convierte en el músico que más tiempo ha permanecido trabajando con Prince. Así es, Morris ha sido tan amable de concedernos una interesantísima entrevista de más de hora y media en la que ha compartido anécdotas y reflexiones sobre su experiencia como músico de Prince. Esperamos que os guste. Y no olvidéis suscribiros a nuestro canal de YouTube, comentar los programas en iVoox o en nuestra página de parpermusic.es o escribir alguna reseña en alguno de los, de los programas en Apple Podcast o cualquiera de ellos. También os invitamos a seguirnos en nuestras redes sociales, Twitter, Instagram y Facebook. Os dejamos ya con la entrevista a Mr. Hayes, esperamos que la disfrutéis y nos enviéis vuestros comentarios. Stay funky. Hello everybody, this is Mr. Hayes and you're watching Purple Music. Bienvenidos a Purple Music. El primer podcast en español sobre Prince, su música, su arte y su legado. This is the dawning of a new podcast revolution. It's time to get funky. As we said in the introduction, we are very excited to start our fourth season with the visit of none other than Maurice Hayes, Mr. Hayes, musician and producer who worked with Prince during two decades. So welcome to Purple Music, Maurice. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to have you here. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, Maurice, you are a multi-talented artist. You are a keyboard player, singer, songwriter, visual artist and producer. But could you tell us how you became a professional musician? Well, I, I started out like many musicians uh, in the church. Uh, I was you know, playing in the church at a young age and, uh, and uh, you know, got interested in music. My mom had a piano. Uh, uh, that she had here at home and and uh, we kind of peck around on it but then it really started when I got into church and that's where the genesis of my playing began and then of course over time as I got went to school and different places it, everything just started to expand from there. Mm -hmm. Okay and um, before becoming a member of the MPG the New Power Generation you played in Maserati So how did you get involved in the band and which are your memories from that period? Well, it's funny. Uh, uh, Maserati, uh, what, the, the genesis of how the Maserati connection came is uh, uh, Prince was in town uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And I used to work with a band called Fingerprint. And uh, Brown Mark and Craig Rice, one of the uh, road managers of Prince, uh, and a bunch of the Prince people came to the show. Uh, and saw the band that I played in. They saw the band play, and they came down afterwards and just said, like, uh, hey, you guys, we see a lot of people play our music, but you guys play like us. You, you play the songs like we do. And so that started a relationship. So uh, a little bit later after that, um, we, uh, we got a chance and a few opportunities to open up for Maserati. Uh, mm -hmm. Brown Mark uh, was, you know, it was Brown's band. And uh, Craig Rice, who was managing Maserati, um, contacted us. And uh, uh, when we were, we had the band had since moved to Texas, to, to Austin, Texas. And he reached out and said, hey, we got a couple of slots opening up in Maserati. They, they took the lead singer from my band 
And then eventually it got me. And that's how I got to Minneapolis was through uh, opening up for them. They saw our band and they liked our singer and they liked me. And so they kind of did a audition for the two of us. And we, you know, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Maurice. Um, do you remember the first time you met Prince? When and how was the first meeting? Yeah, I mean, the first time I came in, in like, like in contact, like, well, not really contact. I came in contact with his bodyguard <laughs> <laughs> uh, at, a, at a nightclub in Minneapolis called The Fine Line. And uh, Prince was there and we were up visiting from Austin. We, were, we came up to work with Brown uh, from, from Austin, Texas. And um, we uh, saw him at the club. He came in and we were like, oh, snap, it's Prince. <laughs> and... Uh, And he was walking towards us, you know, we were going to say, hey, like, hey, hey, Prince, how you doing? You know, and the bodyguard's like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, they just put that big arm on you where you just like, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, stay back. It was so funny because we were like, okay, that that was a bad idea. Um, <laughs> but that's that was at the, the closest point that we met him. And then I would later meet him when I started to work at Paisley Park uh, as a production assistant uh, mm -hmm. through Craig mm -hmm. Rice, who gave me a, an opportunity to work there at the studio. And I just was like driving a van and, you know, doing odd jobs just to just to do work, you know, and work in the studio, you know. And then he would later meet me through, uh, uh, you know, just seeing me around and then, uh, you know, uh, asking about what I do and this sort of thing. And then we just eventually kind of met. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how did Prince tell you that you were becoming a member of his band? How did you feel? Ooh, that was crazy because <laughs> I, I was uh, I went on a Diamonds and Pearls tour mm -hmm. uh, in 1992. And, um, you know, all, all along the road, I mean, it was like Prince was really nice to me. He was really cool. It was, uh, you know, I was the MD for Carmen's band. And so it was very nice. I mean, Prince was just always funny. He was... You know, he was tough, but he was nice. He was funny, you know. Um, and so after the tour, you know, and all along the way, Maite was telling me, like, oh, Prince likes you. And Carmen was like, yeah, Prince likes you. He's going to get to me. I'm like, get out of here. He's <laughs> not going to do that. And uh, after I got back home, uh, after the tour was over, I went to his club, the Glam Slam. And um, uh, uh, one of his guys uh, called me over and uh, he said, boss wants to talk to you. And I, and I went over. And uh, Prince said, hey, grandson, he say, uh, want a job, need some work? <laughs> and I said, sure, I, I'll be over to mow your yard first thing on Monday. And then we, we had a big laugh. And he says, no, nah, man, he says, uh, uh, I want you to be in the band. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm like going like, uh, well, let me check my palm pilot. <laughs> yeah, I can do it. <laughs> you know? And so I was like, whoa, you know, and it, it, it was crazy, though, because it was I had two really intense feelings. Uh, when that happened and and one was of course the euphoria of like man prince just called you over and asked you to be in his band that's like so i'm walking back to my car like i'm leaving the glam slam and i'm like oh my god oh my god oh my god <laughs> ooh, ooh. And, uh, you know and then on the other half of the walk i was like oh my god uh i'm in trouble yeah like, like, <laughs> Like, what if I don't make it? Like, what if I if I'm not good mm -hmm. enough? And I just like I was like, oh my God, now they're gonna know <laughs> the truth. Oh my God! So I was like, oh Jesus! And so <laughs> it was crazy, like the the two dynamics of feeling like the euphoria and mm -hmm. then like like mm -hmm. fear, like mm -hmm. like oh my God, now I gotta really prove out that I'm this good, you know? Because I know his mm -hmm. musicians, man. Prince had the best musicians uh, yeah. around, you know. And I didn't feel like, I was like, I was cool, but I'm like, these guys are like, whoo -hoo. they're like way <laughs> crazy like that, you know? So it was, it was scary. It was like, but, but it, hey, it all worked out. You know, it was great. Everything worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, Prince worked with many musicians and artists, but you are probably the artist who stayed with Prince the longest, which was yeah. from your point, point of view, the reason why he wanted you on his side for so long. You know what? I think it's a few things. Um, I, I I couldn't be for deadly sure because you know I never asked Prince that question. Mm -hmm. You know I would uh, to to say why why man? What you know? I can only guess. And and uh, there's a few things that I always tried to do with regard to Prince. Number one was was to be honest. 
And, and uh, you know, a lot of times, man, you're dealing with an artist. You're dealing with somebody like Prince. You know, you got to understand that this guy has a lot of people around. Everybody wants to like, yeah, Prince, yeah, man. Oh, oh, my God, bro. And, you know, and, 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 you know, you have to be diplomatic about it as well because he's an artist. If Prince ever presented something to me that I didn't like, I didn't just say, oh, oh man, that sucks. You know, I had a way to deal with it because I know I was dealing with an artist. You don't tell mm -hmm. a person their baby is ugly. You know, you don't do that. So you, so when he would bring me two songs and, and I didn't like them, I would say, well, I like this one better than this one, which is mm -hmm. the truth. Mm -hmm. But but I, then I would say, but I don't know if either one of them is a single. And he'd be like, oh, what? That's hot, man. I said, hey, bro, do what you want to do. I'm just telling you, you ask my opinion. That's my opinion, mm -hmm. you know, but do what you want. You the, you the man, you know what I'm saying? And so... I would always try to keep it real with friends and, and as, as, you know, and you, you learn to pick your battles, you know, I didn't have to correct him or do anything like that. Prince knew what he was talking about when it came to music. And, and I don't have any hits to talk about in terms of like what I, how I'm going to dictate to this guy, what he's doing. He's got the track record. So what I would do is just as a friend, I try to be honest and, and, and any place where the emperor doesn't have any clothes, I would just say, Hey man, you're naked right now and say that, you know, and, and try to be straight up. And I, the other thing was I was always funny. You know, uh, I think I was kind of like the court jester around because Prince loved to laugh. He, he loved mm. he loved comedy. He loved to laugh. Mm. And I love hearing him laugh. Prince had a really great laugh, especially when he was like really funny to him. He had this ha, 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 ha. <laughs> like, he would just laugh. So, And that was like, that's the thing I think I miss about him the most. You know, when I think mm. about the music and I think about all of the stuff, those are the times I miss the most. And I think I, I, I would constantly keep him in stitches on some crazy. I mean, Prince would call me some days just like I would have said something to him days ago. Like I called him one time. He used to wear these funny shoes that like they were like these. Uh, they look like I don't know if you've seen these cupcakes that look like like coconut cake. And they're like two little round. He had some shoes that looked like that. Really? And, I said, and I told him, I said, why you big coconut cake shoe wearing? And he just, he fell out laughing. And then a few days later, he just called me like, and I picked up the phone, I'm like, hello. And he just said, coconut cake shoe wearing. And then hang up the phone, you know. And I and he said, and he told me, he said, he called me and said, man, I just think about this crazy crap you tell me all the time. And I just start laughing. Just mm. thinking about all the nutty stuff you say, mm. and so I think th that was that was the thing, and 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 I think the third thing is to, uh, to move it on. The third thing is I always tried not to be the problem. Mm. All right, I always tried to be on be where I needed to be, do what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I I didn't have a whole lot of you know blah 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 back talk and all of this other kind of stuff. He was the artist. All I knew I had to do was comply with what he needed me to do, and uh and, and do my best to do it. You know, and just steer clear of the days that he's looking for a fight. I just kind of like weave my way around and try to stay out of it. You know what I mean? And just get through the day. And I think, uh, you know, and who knows? Maybe he thought I was a puppy in the woods and I, he, he got to help me. He got to, I got to help this guy. I don't know. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I think. <laughs> okay. Um, your first tours with MPG were the Act One and then the Act Two. How did you feel touring with Prince all around the world? Man, it was a dream. You know, when I was when I was younger, when I first saw Prince in, in, in live, when I first saw him, I um I, I declared. I said when I saw Morris Day in the time, and I saw him. I, at first, I said it about the time. I said, man, I'm gonna play with those guys one day. I said Morris Day was like amazing to me, and I was like the band was tight. Jimmy Jam, you know, was one of my favorites, and, and Monty Moyer on mm. keys. I was like, man, these guys are killing, man, and mm. you know Jesse and everybody. And then Prince came on, and I said, oh, my God, this guy's I'm going to play with him. You know, I said both of those. And I played with both of those guys. And, and so it was a dream come true for me to be able to, 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 to say that, being a kid out here in the woods of Arkansas uh, with, with no connections to music and no connection to anything like that. But I had a dream. And I just said, man, I want to do that. And so then all roads led to Minneapolis. You know, it just was like, what do I need to do to be at that level and operate at that frequency, you know? And I had to work hard and I, you know, because I don't read music. I, you know, I didn't read music and, and, uh, uh, and I, and I didn't have connections. I didn't have anything like this. So all I had was a dream and the, in the, in the, uh, and the deep urge to do it, hmm. you know? And I told my mom, I said, mom, I'm going to make you a suitcase full of money one day. 
you mm-hmm. know and so that was the, that was my drive man and, and and it was just like faith and just like I said, god we're gonna go and we're gonna do what we got to do and i just went on faith and we just had to, and, it, and it worked out you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you entered the npg just before uh, prince changed his name <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> how do you find out about that change and which were your thoughts about it well i found out about it like mostly everybody else from television right? <laughs> he was down at, he, he was he was in puerto rico and uh, uh yeah. and uh we saw it on tv and i'm like what <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like what the hell what is what is he doing like what and so when he got back i talked to him i said prince what what so i said prince what is this name thing what what is this he said i feel like that's who i am he said i was looking out over the ocean and it came to me i said but prince what are we supposed to call you like what are we what are we gonna say and he said he said if i'm if i'm always near you never have to call me i said oh my god like no It had to be something artistic and beautiful. And I'm like, yeah, but what if you called on the phone? I'm so, like, like, who is this? <laughs> so I would give him a hard time about it. But but I will tell you this. He was very deadly serious yeah. about this name thing. I, I mean, yeah. very. I, I found that out the hard way. Well, well, well I was with him one night um, uh, after this name change. You know, of course, you know, it was a big thing in the news. The artist formerly known as Prince. It was just all over the place. And we were watching Arsenio. He and I were watching uh, Arsenio. And uh, Sheila E. was on. She was mm-hmm. on the show. And Arsenio asked Sheila E. about, you know, what did he think about, the, what does she think about the, uh, the the name change? And she says, well, hey, you know, he's Prince to me. You know, I'm gonna call him Prince, you know. All this. And he got really upset. He got really mad. He said, see, And, and he was telling me because I was we were watching it and, he, and while she was saying it, he was just like red hot. He was like, you know what, man? He said, this is what I'm talking about. He said, mm-hmm. uh, I don't expect people to understand mm-hmm. why I did what I did. But he said, I do expect them to respect my decision mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and so that kind of pissed him off like like big mm-hmm. time. And, mm-hmm. and, and for people that would come to him and think like, oh, it's a stunt. It's this kind of a thing. All of this. It really bothered him when when people would like like have their say about. It. He's like, you know, I'm on time. I can do what I want to do. It's mm-hmm. it's my thing, and it's it, it, this is how I feel about it, you know. Uh, and 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 he really took that seriously. And so, no matter what we thought about it, I thought it was weird. But, and I actually had to run in a couple of times with him when he called me, like especially when we'd be on tour. And you know, man, we had fans and stuff following us at different places. We had to change our names, like at hotels and things like this, so people couldn't just like. Because we get calls to the room like, hey, Mr. Hayes. I'm like, who's this? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just telling you, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> we, had to, we had to change our names. And so one day Prince called. We had just got to town. And, um, man, I think that was even in Spain. But anyway, we we got, we, we I'm, I'm like, we just get in. The bus pulls in. We got to get ready to go to a thing. So, man, I'm hustling. I got to go change. I got to get. And, and the phone went. Brrr, and I'm like. Uh, Who is? I'm like, who is this? He said, uh, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, uh, "Like, who is this? It's your mom. Like, it's your dad." And and so I'm like, "What?" And so we're going through this whole thing, and then I'm, I, it's just weird because at this point I'm not super. You know, Prince could do some weird stuff with his voice. I wasn't really super sure about who it was, and I was already on the alert. Like, it could be some fans doing some weird stuff. Mm-hmm. And finally, he said something that I would know it was him. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, oh, hey, dude, like, oh, snap. Like, I've been like, because he was getting kind of annoyed that I didn't recognize who he was and he didn't want to say it's Prince Morris. You know, he was he was sticking to the script. He was like, I'm not telling you it's Prince. You got to figure it out. And and it was it was just this few minutes of awkward, you know, uh, you know back and forth. And so it just was weird, you know, on the phone, it was really weird because You can't you can't call him anything, you know. So it was it was mm-hmm. that part was was weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, in fact, the next question is about this because at that time, um, part of the general public and especially the press uh, began to treat Prince as a, as crazy and laugh at him. 
And then how do you think Prince handled this? Well, th that's the thing about Prince, man. He was very, you know, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, unconcerned about, you know, how people thought about his situation. Prince was going to do what he wanted to do. He dressed mm -hmm. the way he wanted to dress. You know, in one of the songs, he says, I put on something that another won't dare, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because because he don't he don't worry about how, you know, this is a guy who went out with the Rolling Stones wearing basically some underwear and a jacket. Yeah. And these people were throwing things at him. Mm -hmm. They were hurling things at him. Mm -hmm. He stuck to his principle. He stuck to whatever his vibe was. And he's always done that. He always did that. And I think that's the thing. Of course, it's hurtful uh, when people say bad things about us, especially if it's just like, you know, what's, what's your point? I mean, everybody likes things and doesn't like things. You can pick any Prince fan and they'll have different favorite songs that they like. And yeah. It's just like, you know, and some will be like, oh, I love this era. Oh, I love this era. I love this song. I love this song. That's the beautiful thing about Prince. He has so much stuff that there's all types of people that can find something to love about his music, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and also about the way he dressed at this era, the way he dressed here. Yeah, he was a very true. much morphing uh, uh, artist and a person mm -hmm. that we watched change over time, you mm -hmm. know? And that's cool. Just like the, everybody got in crazy about this when he got to be a Jehovah's Witness. And, I, you know, I had people ask me about it, like, what, what? I just said, man, this dude is, we're watching in real time. This dude started at 17 years old. As a, as a professional at 17, by the time he got like a sign of record label and stuff like this, he was a teenager, man. Mm -hmm. So we watched we watched him more into this uh, this incredible artist and change over time. And I think that's the whole point about Prince. He was an ever evolving artist and an in a, in a, in a ever evolving human, you know. Mm -hmm. And we, and the difference is we just got to witness this all on television and in music videos. And in concerts, we got to see this change of him over all of those years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Morris, right in the middle of the battle with Warner, uh, the New Power Generation published the album Exodus. Yeah. Is it true that you recorded Get Wild, Hallucination Rain, New Power Soul, Count the Days, and the Exodus has begun in just one day? Is it true? Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, it, it, what's crazy about it is, is the way it came about. Uh, we were just rehearsing like normal, you know, we were rehearsing. And uh, Michael Bland and Sonny T are like, as far as I'm concerned, there is no better drum and bass situation than Michael and Sonny. And mm -hmm. I came in a rehearsal and we were on the sound stage, and um, they were just goofing around, you know, they're just like, <laughs> <laughs> And they were just matching each other lick for lick. Like Sonny would play exactly what Michael was playing. And you're just going like, I'm just looking at him like, what the, just, I mean, it was just crazy. Mm -hmm. And Prince walks and I'm at the back door. Like I'm just standing there listening. And I'm just like, man, these dudes, man. And so Prince walks in, the, the, he comes in the sound stage. He said, what's happening? And I said, oh my God, we should just, they should be making a record or something like this. Cause I'm like, this is incredible. So Prince says, yeah, we should make a record. He reaches, there's a phone on the wall by the door. He goes to the phone. He picks up the phone. He tells us, I think he tells Ray, he says, uh, Ray, um, he says, um, he says, get the, the crew over, move all of the gear in the studio A and put some tape up. We're going to record just mm -hmm. like that. And so when he tells people stuff, people start moving. So the crew comes in. They start striking the gear down from the uh, sound stage and they move it over to Studio A. And then eight songs, I think, out of that record, like eight tracks we did in one day. He just called and changes. He just mm -hmm. says, okay, Michael, play this beat. Boom, 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 boom. Give me a lead like that. So, so the thing is, just like that, man, he goes in and then he starts and he calls changes. And, every, and then he calls the solos. He calls the, uh, you know, we're going to do it in this key. We're going to do this. Here's the line to play. And then just go for it, and 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 I hope one day, a state if you're listening, put out this record again, and yes, and do the outtakes where you can hear him talking in the studio, like where you can hear him telling us the changes and all of the stuff that when Sonny does something funny, we all laugh wow. and it's it's incredible, it's <laughs> incredible, you know, 
so that's 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 that uh that's just remarkable what he was able to do just like just like that man just like just pick up the phone tell ray put some tape up get the crew to move the stuff over thank you good night just like that boom <laughs> yeah and i have to 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 thank you all because i love exodus is one of my favorite albums yeah. ever okay so uh let's let's refresh our minds because you uh, you did come exodus the beautiful experience film the gold experience glam slam concerts uh powerful tv appearances you were very very busy in that period maurice very very oh, yeah. busy how yeah. do you remember those wild days but amazing days well well it, it, it just was <laughs> It, like I said, it was the realization of a dream. You know, when it, when you get in this business as a bar band and as a person and looking at your heroes, you know, I watched Prince and Michael Jackson and, and you know, in the time and like all of these bands that we thought were like, and these artists that we thought, man, that's it, man. You know, that were the great artists, you know, James and Sly Stone and Parliament, mm -hmm. P-Funk, you know, all of the great cameo, all the great bands. And if you played in a band, That's what you wanted to do. You were like, one day I want to be big like them. So we used to try to write all those songs, and I, you know, we played original songs, and then we would, you know, we do cover band stuff, you know. But we always had the dream to like write our own music and try to be like Prince and try to be like Michael and try to be like people like that and try to get to that level, and, and to actually have that come to be was was really remarkable, and it was everything that I thought it would be, you know. I, and I always said, you know. I always told God, I said, God, if you let me get to that point, don't let me ever get stupid and do stupid things and, 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 you know, tear my life up and all of this kind of stuff to be a rock star and to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I just always maintain my, my, uh, I try to always stay humble. I try to always stay, just stay out of the trouble situation and, and just, you know, just enjoy the moment doing music and doing what I dream to do. You know, and I was able to do that. You know, I was on television. You know, I was a hero in my little small town. You know, and people that went to my school, you know, they saw me. And it was like, you know, everybody's like, yeah, man, Morris, the dancer guy. He, he, that was weird because I used to be a dancer. Nobody knew me for really like playing keyboards and stuff. And so they were like, when they, when people would say Morris the playing, with, they're like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Morris Hayes, the dancer guy, <laughs> is playing with Prince? Like, how, what? Like, what? <laughs> so it was a real shock to a lot of people that I went from that to that. And mm -hmm. so it, it was it was really amazing that, you know, you know, you, you drive it in a car and you pull up next to somebody and they're playing your song in the car. And it's like, wow, you know, that's crazy. You know, that's the kind of thing you always dream of. And, and you turn on MTV and there you are. Or you turn on the news and there you are. You turn on the award shows and there you are. It's yeah. like it, it was really crazy. It was a, an amazing life, amazing journey. Um, um it, it was just it was just awesome something that i really enjoy about that time is watching the music videos of the of that era uh get wild the good life i hate you 18 and over dolphin they are crazy <laughs> and yeah. and so artistic at the same time and you all yeah. seem to be having lots of fun and yeah. for people as busy as you were how was the process of recording music videos with prince what's and what's your favorite video that you recorded with him i, I have to tell you that was <laughs> one of the things that i thought i would love and i don't <laughs> <laughs> i i thought the, the the greatest thing about being a rock star is like you get to make music videos you get to be on mtv you know the the dh1 bet all of this i thought that's Yeah, this is photo shoots. Yeah, music videos. Yeah, <laughs> man. You know, promotional tours. Yeah, no. <laughs> it was like it's it it it's 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 cool when you do it. You you get to do it, but then the, it's extraordinarily tedious work. And mm -hmm. with Prince, it was always even more so because Prince was a micromanager. He was directing. He was. You know, it would be people there, but he was the one giving the orders. It wasn't like you hire a guy and he comes like, okay, Prince, this is my vision. I want you to go stand over there. He's going to be mm -mm. one to decide. 
I'm standing here. I'm going to run over there and do this. And then, so your job is to follow me. You figure out <laughs> what I'm doing. All right. I'm not figuring out what you're doing. And so we would be there for hours and hours, dressed up, makeup, full, and you sit for hours. Like, when is this scene going to be shot? When is it? Oh my God, kill me now. I'm just like, it, it, it's like it's a long process. Mm -hmm. it's it's it, it, it's kind of it's fun to do it but then after because of the way prints work we we would shoot two or three videos in a day like wow. like uh you know and just have different sets built mm -hmm. and like it'd be like because we had prince had a giant facility you know paisley park is a big place so they mm -hmm. build one set on the two sets on the sound stage shoot on opposite ends and one in the other uh, room that's the, like the, the loading dock they set that up as a place to shoot and and build a jail cell in there for, like there was a jail cell for i hate you that oh, you know, really? that they built that they that they had built but 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 didn't use because and it cost like a hundred thousand dollars to build it and they tore it down <laughs> and i was like and i went in there i was like this is awesome it's a jail in paisley and i'm in jail i've never been to jail and i'm in jail and then the guy says hey come out of there we got to tear that down i'm like what you just built it we're not going to use it. I'm like, oh my God, can I have it? <laughs> I went to jail. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was just crazy. And it was so much time. I remember before one of the tours, we shot like Papa and a bunch of loose and a mm -hmm. bunch of videos that we did um, uh, before we were going to Europe. We literally were there till four in the morning and we had a flight mm -hmm. like at eight in the morning mm -hmm. and we had been shooting for days, you know, and we were like, pissed off because we're like man i gotta go home and pack you know prince got people to pack his clothes <laughs> sure. his people to handle all of that we don't have that we got like, prince we gotta go home bro we gotta we gotta tour we gotta go pack we've been here for three days bro like like can we go home and it's just <laughs> like we finish at four in the morning i gotta drive sunny all the way across town it was so crazy and i'm like going oh my god i just got to where i hated <laughs> The videos and stuff like that. <laughs> we were talking about uh dolphin video the other day that you and Tommy Barbarella are playing piano on a bed. And yeah. it was quite strange. <laughs> yeah. Very funny. What was what was great about that video? I, and it's one of my favorites. Um I thought Prince looked great in it. I liked it. The outfit he had on was very cool. He yeah. looked so nice with the Ask God the, the the thing, and it was and Prince. What he wanted was he wanted that video to be shot all in one constant shot. Mm -hmm. That sh yeah. that that video is like, you, you know, he picked all of the points and the camera. And as as the camera moved, then we add people and we add things. Mm -hmm. And and then when he pulled out, to, when he pulled in for the guitar solo, then Prince said, "Everybody, come over to the bed and just play your instrument on the bed." When he pulls <laughs> out, then we would all be on there. And it was it was a great concept, a great idea, and it was a lot of fun. You know, we were sitting in the bed with Prince, you know, beating around and doing a lot of stuff. And so it was it was fun. It was it was a lot of fun. And I like to play it live. We played on the David Letterman in the legendary uh, yeah. situation where Prince didn't want to shake David Letterman's hand, and so he told me before we go on stage, he said, "Do you have the gunshot sample?" I said, "Uh, I can get it. You know, I can put mm -hmm. it in there." He said, "Yeah." He says, "Go in. Put, you know, we got two minutes." He said, uh, find a sample. We're going to cut out the, um, the the second verse, go straight mm -hmm. to the bridge. No mistakes. And I'm like, going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. I got to get, get this. And it was crazy, but it was we put, we did it. Everything worked without a hitch. And it was a beautiful song. He mm -hmm. did his whole thing, got shot in the head and drug off by a big cocoa. Yeah. And it, it, was, it was amazing. You know, it was like, wow, that's 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 crazy. You know, it's awesome. Yeah, um, Maurice, in the beautiful experience film, uh, during Days of Wild, Prince shaved your head. Can ah. you tell us whose idea it was? <laughs> well, you know, it was Prince's idea. The thing was, um, <laughs> we, had been sh we had been doing a lot of videos and everything, and, and, and Prince uh, famously, uh, you know, would, would revisit things, and he'd shoot something, and then he'd decide, you know what, I want to go and shoot some more stuff to this. So I wanted to to change my appearance, but what I had to make sure of before I did it, I had to ask Prince, like Prince, I want to like shave my head. 
uh, would that mess up any continuity because I couldn't shave my head and then he wanted to shoot something where I had hair because then it'd be like, you don't have any hair. I can't shoot anything else with, with no hair. So mm -hmm. I said, before I did it, I had to let him know, like Prince of Thema, I'm going to cut my hair off. And he says, um, he said, yeah, that's fine. I, I, I'm, we're not going to go back and shoot anything. And then he said, you know what? He said, um, uh, um, why don't we do this? Because uh, we were at a, we were at a club. And uh, and I was I just happened to be talking to him, you know, and I told him what I was going to do. And we were sitting with this guy named Ahmad Rashad. And Ahmad was a famous football player that was now he's a news. I mean, he does like sports and stuff. But Ahmad was there for this thing we were getting ready to do for the NBA uh, uh, basketball uh, all-star game. That's what mm -hmm. that party was all about. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. we had like a bunch of celebrities there, you know, and a bunch of sports cats were there. And so Prince said... Um, uh, he said, that's okay. Uh, when I first told him about it, he says, um, take, we had a guy named Paris Patton and Paris shot the, uh, the video that we did in, uh, in London, uh, that we did, that was awesome. Uh, for, uh, the sacrifice to victory. The sacrifice uh, that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he said, take Paris with you and film it. I may use that in some footage, just take Paris and have him shoot it when they cut your hair. I said, Sh okay, sure. You know, that, that wasn't a big shock. He had parachute everything from rehearsal to just just to add in case he wanted to add some clips in the thing. And so um, I said, cool. So I let Paris know and then we'll go to the, he'll, he'll film and get my head shaved. So I go to see Prince at the slam later on. And I'm sitting next to Ahmad. And uh, he says, um, he said, Morris, I got an idea. He says, why don't you let me cut your hair? And I said, I said, wait a minute. I said, Brown Mark told me, whatever you do, don't ever let Prince cut your hair. <laughs> now, Brown Mark told me this because Prince cut his hair for like uh, uh, sexuality, I think. And if you look at Brown Mark's hair, it's looking pretty pitchforky. And uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not a great haircut. And Mark said, whatever you do, Morris, don't ever let. I said, and I said to Mark, I said, why in the hell would I let Prince cut my hair? Like, I would. <laughs> I was like, why, why would I even, why would that even be a thing? And and so I thought Mark was crazy. I'm like, why, why would I let Prince cut my hair? That's crazy. So Prince said it. He said, he said, yeah, Morris, why don't you let me cut it? That's the thing. And I said, wait a minute. I said, Brown Mark said never to let you. He said, well, you're going to shave it off, right? I said, yeah. He said, well, then I can't mess it up because you're going to cut it all off. I said, yeah, I guess you got a point. I said, do I get hazard pay? And he, he said, <laughs> and so he um he he goes yes and he tells Ahmad he says Ahmad he says uh like a keyboard player we, he's gonna let me cut his hair at the show this is gonna be awesome and then we did the show mm -hmm. uh, he had my hair like really bouffanted up like it was all sticking up high and then when we got the days of wild um he had he he just came over and he said I'm just gonna take the thing and just take a couple of swipes out. And then his girl uh, uh, was gonna, she was gonna um, come up and finish me off on the next song, mm -hmm. and it was the craziest thing because he did the two, yeah, yeah, and then that was it, and I just had half a head done, <laughs> and then it was just like you know he took my thing off and then did it, and I remember as she came and uh, on on the song and then just kept shaving while I was playing. Man, it was hair in my mouth, it was hair everywhere, it was all <laughs> in my keyboard. And but she got it all shaved <laughs> off, and we went we went off the stage, and this was really weird. So I'm six foot five. I'm pretty tall. I'm like 100 and what 196 centimeters. I'm pretty tall. Mm -hmm. Prince is not so tall, you know. And <laughs> no. so he's standing on some stairs, and I'm standing on the floor, and we're like even height with each other. Mm -hmm. And he leans over and kisses me in the top of my bald head, and he kisses me in the head and says, "Morris." That's one of the best. This is rock and roll. He said that was one of the awesome things of, of one of the most awesome things of rock and roll we just did. Mm -hmm. And he said he was so happy. He was like, that was so cool. And then he kissed me again in the head. And I was like, ah, that's so weird. <laughs> but it was cool, man. It was just like it was a moment, you know, and it was like some days a while. And it was crazy, you know. He, yeah. yeah, but he's he's not a good barber. I would not recommend <laughs> anybody to let him. Okay. <laughs> Uh, today marks the exact 27th 
anniversary of the publication of the Gold Experience album, which we are Whoa. analyzing for our next program yesterday. And I have is to say, today? it is, it is today. <laughs> yeah. And I have to say that I am a proud owner of a Gold Experience sent by you, Maurice. I have uh, your signature here. <laughs> yeah, it was in a Macy or Parker concert back yeah, in yeah. 2004, probably. Yeah, I was so happy to have here, to have wow. this signed by you. Um, well, it is said that Prince wanted the albums come and the Gold Experience to be published at the same time. So they could compete with each other in a certain way. Is that true? Did you did he ever tell you uh, which his plans were with both records? No, I don't. We, I don't think we discussed that. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think. Um, I know that you know we did so much recording back in the day, and I'm trying to figure out uh, time wise if we recorded all of that stuff at the same time. I know we did a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff in the vault. There's just like stuff that we did that ended up on. Um, around the same era that ended up on a uh uh what was that um oh my gosh the six album uh set that we did um that had six. dream theater it, it had like it had five it had five cds in it i'm, I, I'm just crystal drawing a blank ball. crystal crystal ball, crystal ball. Mm -hmm. yeah so some of the stuff ended up on crystal ball like you know just different stuff and so it was a lot of things but i don't i don't ever recall uh, him like wanting to make the records compete. What I did recall was me, me, you know, Prince was really, really fighting about this record with the label, mm -hmm. and 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 I asked him about. it. I said, "Well, Prince, I don't, I guess I don't understand," um, because he was always ahead of the label. He was always like when I came in for Diamonds and Pearls, right? Prince had a piano that said "Damn you," and I was like, "Why is your piano like cussing at people? Like, what is?" Why, why damn you on the piano? And he said, mm -hmm. oh, it's a song on the, 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 the next album that's coming out, the Symbol record, right? And I'm like, well, this is the Diamonds and Pearls tour. Like, he was already, he played me the movie in Germany, uh, Three Chains of Gold, that he had done with that, with that record, with the, with the Symbol record. And I'm like, you, you got the album, a movie, all of it. I'm like, bro, this is like crazy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you already, he's already, when he, that record is done, he's already on mm. to the next one, right? Mm. So when it comes out, then it's like, all right, that's out. He's so far ahead. He's like over it. He's bored. I said, so Prince, why, why is it, you don't want this record to come? He says, well, I'm bored with it. It's like, it's mm. old music to me now. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, but it's old because we play it. <laughs> I mean, if you don't play it, it'll be new. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but the problem was, Prince was TikTok age back then. You know, kids now can go on TikTok, Instagram, and all these platforms. Mm. They could put out songs today, pow, bing, pow, mm. boom, pow, ping. Yeah. That's what Prince wanted then. Mm -hmm. He was ahead of the game. That's what he wanted to be able to do then so that he could put out music as he sees fit, monetize it as he sees fit, use it as he sees fit. That's the idea. It just was way ahead of its time. Yeah. And now mm -hmm. here we are, you know? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, but that's what he wanted to do. And and it just the 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 record labels, of course, they had they they were the gatekeepers and they were the timekeepers in terms of no, we want to learn mm -hmm. release this album a year from now. We're gonna mm -hmm. do this, and we're gonna and he was like, Bro, I'm over it. I already did that. I'm on to the next thing. And he just I think the the whole model with TikTok and instead and like how things are released now that's why these kids man they're out here like bam 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 the record labels are going crazy because they can't keep up with them and they're making money like hand over fist you know and i and, I, and that's the model that he was trying to do just the technology wasn't there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. morris michael b sonny t tommy barbarella maite prince and you made up the wildest and tightest live band of the 90s what are your memories of the live shows from 94 and 95, where you only play new stuff? Yeah. Well, you know, the crazy thing is, man, is that we were a super well-rehearsed band. What made that band so tight and so great is we rehearsed all the time, you know, like going to work. You know, uh, in the latter years, we didn't rehearse that way uh, with Prince. You know, we had all gotten to a point where he expected a certain level of performance out of us. 
But back then, every day, whether Prince was there or not, we came in like going to McDonald's. This is like you punch the clock in, you go in, you do stuff. We play together, you get tight. That's why that band with four people besides Prince, you know, and, and well, five with my take. Mm-hmm. It was like we were a weld oil machine. And and it's like, so we could we were basically a jukebox that could pull up anything that Prince could pull out and then we could hit it. You mm-hmm. know, that's the kind of way we rehearsed. And that's what he loved about, I think, about that band and then subsequent uh, bands. Because the, the thing is, the, the, the farther in the time you go, the more music that it is that you have to learn. So as time goes on, you not only have to learn the songs that you did, but you have to learn the revolution. You got to learn the, just the Prince era stuff. You have to learn everybody's music. So by the time you get the Third Eye Girl, they got to know the whole catalog of everything mm-hmm. because that's just the evolution over time. And you need to know all of that material. So the longer it goes, the harder it gets. Because mm-hmm. like Prince would say, too many hits, so little time. <laughs> you know, he would, he would say that all the time because it's like it's so many songs and it's so much material. You that He even started having a, a teleprompter because he said, man, I can't remember all these yeah. songs, man. It's so many songs. There's so many mm-hmm. things to learn, you know. And so it just was had to be uh, a situation where the longer it goes, the more material it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And during that period of 94 and 95, you had an important role playing the organ, an instrument not very common until then in Prince's music, and which yeah. brought a new sound to his music. Did Prince decide yeah. that you should play the organ, or was it your, your suggestion? What, no, it, what, what it was is that uh, when I was doing the thing with Carmen, um, mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of what shaped a lot of what shaped uh, uh, Prince was uh, he, he would take the strengths of the people that he would bring in. He would come and hear the rehearsals and, and I would be playing these chords on my keyboards and a lot of stuff. And Prince told me, he said, like, because he looked at my setup. I only had a very, I had a very meager setup. It wasn't that much stuff. Like Barbarella had these giant, uh, you know, and Rosie had these giant, things with all of these keyboards and stuff in it it was amazing you know and i mean i love that kind of thing too but i couldn't afford it i just had my couple little keyboards that i had and that's what i had and so i had to really get the use out of those units that i had to get out of them and um i remember him telling me one day at carmen rehearsal he says man he says morris for just you know a couple of keyboards you got a really big sound like you play these really lush big church chords you know and, and, and it just like he was marveling at that and how much sound I could get out of the little amount of stuff that I had. And I had a little rack with another little sampler in it that I just would put some samples in. And and and, um, and uh, speaking of which, one of my one of my personal uh, greatest uh, contributions to the Prince legacy for me was Prince came to my rehearsal and I used to, you know, I was real tech savvy and I used to put loops and put them on uh, on my keyboard and play play to loops. And we were playing two Prince songs. We played 17 Days. And uh, and Prince heard a loop from this it's a European group, I think called TKA. I had this loop from one of their tracks, uh, 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 Information Society. I think that's mm-hmm. what it was. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I played this loop under 17 Days. And he's like, <laughs> and he's like, stop the press. <laughs> and so what happened is Levi Caesar called me and said, man, Morris, what did you do to Prince? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, man, he came from your rehearsal and he said, Morris is using loops under our song. We got to do that. We just got to use our own loops under our own song. He says, that's crazy. Like what he's doing, it's like we we have to do that. So he figured out a way to get it into Michael Bland's drums instead of like having the keyboard. I was triggering it in my band Mm -hmm. because I knew how to do that. And so he was just like, I don't want Barbarella or Rosie doing it. I want Michael Bland to do it. So what they did is they figured out how to put a start stop, put it in a sampler for him to start and stop it. And mm-hmm. what that would allow the sound to do was to be like the record, to have that four bar loop, boom, boom, pack, boom, pack, boom, boom, pack. and then we play on top of it. And that that never changed for Prince to, for the rest of his career. He did mm-hmm. that all the way throughout until, until the end. Mm-hmm. And that was something that I introduced to him. And I, mm-hmm. and I personally feel great about that because uh just seeing that he saw that as a way to like like go oh my god I, that's what we're going to do now and then for him to take that and run with it is like it's like it's like uh what's my man from uh Shalomar Jeffrey 
uh, uh, Daniels, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, from Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was watching him on Soul Train uh, do the moonwalk. Mm-hmm. And I just was like, whoa, what is what is that? And I and I went out and learned it. And pretty soon after that, I saw Michael Jackson. And so I had Howard Hewitt, who was the singer for 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 for, uh, for them for Shalimar. And uh, Howard came to my house to uh, to do some recording at my house at my studio. And and uh, we, he was telling me one of his Prince stories. And then I told him about Jeffrey how I, I saw Jeffrey doing the moonwalk, and I learned it on my garage and and my porch in 1979 or something like this, 1980 or something. And I learned it uh, watching him on Soul Train. And he said, "Guess who else saw it?" He said, "Michael Jackson." And, and instead of Michael learning it like you, somebody called Jeffrey and said, Michael wants to see you. And Jeffrey went over there and the rest is history. Jeffrey ended up being Michael's choreographer, yeah. taught him to talk. And Je- he said, Jeffrey called it the backslide. When Michael did it, he did it on TV and did on that show, called it the moonwalk and the rest is history. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, a lot of people don't know that Michael saw Jeffrey do that dance and, and basically got Jeffrey to teach it to him. And now he owned it, and that and so that's one of those things in history. A lot of people don't know. They think Mike was somewhere and he dreamed that move up, and then that's it. But that's what happened. I saw it. Michael saw it because mm-hmm. Michael watched Soul Train too, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. uh, it, but he could call the man. He just said, "Get the call, bring me the one they call Jeffrey Daniel." Click, and somebody <laughs> goes goes find Jeffrey Daniel. And so for me to do that piece of uh, that piece of Prince history, where he saw me playing a loop under his song "17 Days." And it changed the way he looked at music in that way uh, from a technological standpoint, because what that allowed him to do, because I could play it freely. And that was the trick about Prince. He hated playing the tracks like uh, like sequences, because a sequence will lock you into a form. Prince don't want to be locked into a form. He mm-hmm. wants to be able to have the loop run. And if he feel like playing a solo extra long, he'll play the solo. You know, if he feels like, you know, he don't want to come in right away. He's not locked into coming in right when you think he's when the song's supposed to come in. I've watched him change the show like that. You had to always be ready. Like, don't come in until he starts singing. Don't come in until he tells you to come in because he's going to groove. He's going to fill out the audience and see if they're feeling it. And if he feel like he needs to take a solo before we start, he'll do that. And that's what gave him the ability to do it because we weren't locked into a track. You just locked into a beat. And so we, we just used the groove. And so we could play a song for 25 minutes and just groove on it because it wasn't a sequence. It just mm-hmm. loops, you know? And so that was, that was a big deal. And I, and I'm, I'm very proud of that, that mm-hmm. I at least had that influence on his, on his music to, for him mm-hmm. to do that until the end of his career. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, during the live shows uh, of the same period, you, you were the one who triggered samples from the keyboards. How yeah. difficult was it? Both. To fit, oh. oh my God! Both of us, Tommy, myself, and Michael Bland, all mm. triggered samples. Mm. Uh, yeah. We mm. we had designated. Michael had drum pads, mm. and he also had triggers, so that the what what made it really great is once he got triggers, he could make the kick drum, and the snare drum samples from the album, mm. put that on his physical. So when we played songs like uh, uh, one of my favorites is "Question of You." Prince mm-hmm. told me how he made the sounds for Question of You. He said, um, he said, well, the kick drum on Question of You is me taking a basketball and I bam, <laughs> and, and <laughs> sample the basketball hitting the floor. And that's the kick drum. Oh, so you can't get a kick drum. So what we would do is take the sample from that basketball and then put it on Michael, Michael Bland's drum. So he go, bam, 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 bam. and it's just like the record. All right, mm-hmm. so Michael triggered samples. He had some some loops that he triggered, and some 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 thunderstorms and all kind of stuff. And Barbarella triggered samples. Mm-hmm. We all triggered them. That's why we had like horn section. He called us the hotel killers because mm-hmm. we 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 killed a lot of jobs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with that band because we had the horn section in the box. We had mm-hmm. other his other. He didn't have to have two guitar players because Tommy would play his other guitar parts. I mm-hmm. would play vocal background vocals of prince so we didn't have, me and sonny would sing on top with prince but in my day but i had prince's vocals on a key mm. so i could play his vocals yeah. so all of it sounded like the record you know mm. but we could play it in real time 
So, but the problem with that is, is if you make mistakes, <laughs> that's where the problem is. And yeah. sometimes we made mistakes and, and it was catastrophic when it went wrong. <laughs> so I had many a show where I did, oh my God, it was just terrible. It was just terrible. That's all I can tell you. Uh, sometimes because with technology, sometimes the machine mm. didn't load as quickly. You know, yeah. these things were, were technical things that could happen. It mm. was inevitable at some point when you're doing something like that. I remember I, I was friends with some of the guys who played with Janet and Michael Jackson. And they'd come by and watch, you know, when they'd be in town, they'd come over to my studio and I'd be working on some stuff because I was constantly working on show stuff. And, uh, and when I showed them what I was doing, they were like, how in the hell are you doing that? And and, mm. and I remember the, one of the guys who was playing with Michael said, man, we tried to do that. And every he said, we could not make that work. He said, we couldn't do it. It's just like it was too inconsistent. And, and like sometimes we'd hit the sample something. How do you freaking do it? I just said, <laughs> and when I, when Prince, I remember Prince uh, Lenny Kravitz was over one day and it was just me, Prince and Lenny. And Prince told me, he said, Morris, just play your parts on this song. And uh, and I played this stuff, and it was crazy. And Lenny was like, "What the? How? It sounds like you got three hands. Like, how are you doing that?" <laughs> and Prince said, "Prince said to Lenny, he says, ancient Chinese secret, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know." But it was crazy. You know, it was a lot of stuff, and a lot of things could go wrong. But when it went right, it was great. You know, and that's the thing. And that's that that takes us back to the practice and rehearsal. We had to learn that technique and learn to do stuff. Nobody did it in the business the way we did it. Nobody. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, they said, Why would you do it? It's crazy. It's insane for y'all to do this this way. You know, we just have a tape running and it's the same every night. I said, and therein lies the problem. Prince changes the show every night. So yeah. we don't want mm -hmm. it to be the same. I yeah. said, therein lies the problem and that's why we do it this way because mm -hmm. he don't, he's going to change it and every day it's going to be something different. That's mm -hmm. why we have to do it this way. Boris, mm -hmm. <laughs> you came back to Prince Band in 2006 during the mm -hmm. 31-21 period. Mm -hmm. Were you at those famous, famous parties at his home in Los Angeles? Oh, yeah. Could you tell oh, yeah. us some something <laughs> how the parties were? Yeah, I, I think it was around the end of 2005 when I when I went back and Prince was having the parties at the 3121 address at, 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 uh, uh, on Mulholland, and uh, and it was mm -hmm. awesome, man. It was like it was the coolest thing ever because Prince had these parties at his house and Herbie Hancock would be there, uh, you know, Joni Mitchell, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Alicia Keys. Like a lot of like you know a lot of people like Christina Aguilera, uh, you know uh, Jessica Simpson, the guy who was Frodo on Lord of the Rings. I mean, <laughs> it was like everybody was at this Lawrence Fishburne. Everybody was at the house, you know, and wow. it was just like a jam at his house, and it was so dope, man. I mean, it was just like fun. It was like all of these people at his house. Oprah Winfrey's there. I met J.J. Abrams at his house. Uh, uh, J.J. and Greg. Uh, you know, which now are longtime friends, just meeting them at the house. You know, Eric Benet. Everybody would come by the house, and and it would be this house jam, and it and this happened over three different houses. You know, mm. it was that house, and then we we moved to another house where the basketball player that uh, Prince rented the house from, mm -hmm. and, and it was yeah. funny because not only was that a different location, but Prince changed the address to thirty one twenty one over there too, and it would make the the, the postman got confused, like. Uh, <laughs> The mail, uh, this is 3121, this is a uh, 1502, uh, you know, it was just like, Prince changed the number on the mailbox, the 3121 had a different address, mm -hmm. and they were like, the post people were like, what do we do with this mail? <laughs> <laughs> it was so crazy, man, huh. but those were legendary parties, you know, Selma mm -hmm. Hayek and, and, and Maroon 5, like everybody that would come through, man, it was so much fun. And just uh, amazing, you know, like uh, uh, all the different people that would come through those parties and, and, and just be there, man. And we just jamming at the house, mm -hmm. having fun. You know, yeah, that actually went over four different houses, man, like four different places. 
that we ended up being at. He'd have DJ Rashida come in and mm-hmm. she'd do the DJ thing and then uh and we play, you know. And you know, Whitney, everybody would be there, man. It was like it was crazy, you know, just like just Erica Badu, like all of the people would just come through, man, and it was it was amazing. You know, and it was a lot of fun and, and um, you know, everybody would have a good time. I remember talking to uh, Chris Tucker and he's just like, Man, this is like the coolest thing ever. You know, it's like it was funny, you know, and and and, and uh, just every everybody you think, you know, Snoop, everybody just mm-hmm. come through, and it was just it was cool. But what was funny too is some of the people that couldn't come in that Prince wasn't really crazy about. They told him like, uh, Jack Black is down there. He said, No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm like, Black Jack was just in King Kong, bro. No. <laughs> oh my God. Poor Jack. So- uh, do you, yeah. During that year, you toured with Tamar. You yeah. were in tour with Tamar. Uh, then you played in this res- residency in Las Vegas. Then at the beginning of two- 2007 uh, at the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. And just a few months after that, uh, the historical 21 nights in London. Sure. Uh, given its relevance, uh, yeah. do you think that the period of two, these two years were, were were the most important in your career with Prince your career I, I, I certainly think it was a it, it, it was a very a powerful time I mean Prince had already done a lot of stuff man by the time we got to the Super Bowl and and when we started kind of looking at doing this whole thing with this residency thing that turned out to be a very brilliant stroke you know to just say hey Morris we're going to set up shop in Vegas. We're going to get our own club. We're going to do it like we want. We're going to play. How we, we're going to invite our friends to open up for us. And we figured, like, man, this is cool. Prince said, Morris, bring your car out. Because I just bought this cool little convertible. I just like this little electric convertible. He's like, that car's cool. He said, I'm bringing my car out. You bring your car out. We're going to have fun. We're just going to take over Vegas, man. And it was mm-hmm. it was cool. You know, I had my little convertible. He had his, he had his Bentley and and all of this stuff and we parking in the back it was like some super fly stuff you know it's like cool man we got keys to the hotel we got studio in the hotel we just a couple of rock stars man and it was just <laughs> like it was like fun uh we had our own place we could we could go eat we had our own chef i mean it was dope and then w- when we got to 21 nights it was like really incredible it's just like we just turned everything up after the super bowl it was just like everything was on a hundred. It was like the meters over here in the red, you know. And we get to London and, and everything. And I mean, I, I mean, I think that's probably still a record for that place. I think Michael Jackson was going to do fifty one nights, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, he didn't get a chance to do it. I wish he had it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, that was going to be an incredible. I saw Michael uh, in rehearsal before before he, he passed away, and I saw the rehearsal of the show, man, and it was. Whew, I told Prince, I went over and said, man, Prince, I said, Mike got some big boy stuff going on over here, man. There's some big boy going on over here. It was an amazing show that they were going to do. And a lot of my friends played with Michael and, and it was, it was a very sad thing, but it was definitely around that period, you know, when we did 21 nights and, and when we did a lot of that stuff, it was incredible. You know, it was just like Prince was just still like going, like even after musicology, like Prince was just like killing it, you know? And that's what I loved about Prince is just like, he just went over all of these eras. And, you know, a lot of people like stop at the revolution. Some may stop at the MPG and some stop at the band with no name, like with Sheila and Levi and Miko Weaver and all of these folks. There was, there was just every era of Prince was just great. I, I don't know a, a really a bad era uh, that, that I would just say, oh yeah, this is like, it sucks. He always managed to make something happen out of everything that he did. You know, and it was always something going to be great, you know, and people can pick. And that's what's beautiful. People can pick and choose the area they like. Man, it don't bother me one bit if somebody's like, well, I like the revolution better than people. Man, cool. I love the revolution, too. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with that. They're, yeah. one, they're, they're my heroes. I love everybody in that band because that, that's what motivated me to want to do what I wanted to do with the revolution and all of the bands that he had prior to that. So I don't it don't bother me. In the least. It's all family to me. It's all family. So it's all good. They're just like people I look up to that I ended up uh, wanting to emulate. And so, man, it's all mm-hmm. it's all love for me. Mm-hmm. Maurice, what did you learn for, from Prince as an artist? 
Well, as, as an artist, you know, one thing I learned from Prince is that just because you see Prince do something don't mean you can do it. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, um, it, it, it doesn't mean that that you are on the same, what you can take away from is some of the things that, that he learned. Uh, I mean, some of the things that you learned from him and try to apply it. Because I think all you have to do is look at the proof is in the pudding. Uh, Prince has worked with so many people, but mm -hmm. not many have risen to that level. You know, you have some that have done extraordinary with well, Jam and Lewis, Wendy and Lisa, uh, you know, um, there's been some, some folks in the camp that have done, you know, Jesse did really well, Morris has done really well. But for, the, but, 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 but for as many people that have been, they're all incredible artists under mm -hmm. themselves, they're all incredible, but they don't have that same level of success that Prince does, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, all of us, were around him and all of us saw him do these things, but it's a lot harder than you think to try to emulate a lot of that stuff. I'd come back to my studio and try to do that. You know, Prince Giff was at, operating at a different frequency than mine. And and I can I can look at him do some stuff, but uh, I'm just like, wow, that's that's <laughs> crazy what he just mm -hmm. did, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh but we but we do learn certain things. And what I think the key is and all of the stuff that I've learned is, you know, um uh, as a, as a, as a, you know, trying to be a band leader and trying to be somebody that's in that, in that role as an MD. And it's just like, those are the things that I take away that I gravitated to. Everybody doesn't have the songwriting chops as Prince. Many people don't, you know, mm -hmm. I don't write songs like Prince. I'm not prolific like that. I, I just not, you know, Jam and Lewis were very fortunate. They found a formula that worked for them and they were extraordinarily successful and they still mm -hmm. are at, at what they do. You know, Sheila did very well. You know, it's a lot of people who have managed, you know, to find a niche and find something, something great and each to his own, man. I just like, I appreciate the things that I've learned. I know how to put a band together. I know how to, you know, do things like that because of Prince. And so mm -hmm. those are all things that I cherish from my time. And, 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 you know, and, and that's, you know, and the cool thing about that is that everybody's, you know, uh, one thing I learned for myself is to know my place in the room. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Prince told me one time, he says, Morris, he says, uh, what makes bands great? Uh, he told me a kind of a thing about like Michael Jordan. Where it's like, you know, Michael could shoot 60 points in a game and, and you know, score that in a game and still lose the game. He said, mm -hmm. where, where, where Michael and them start winning is when they all start playing like a team. He said, in the NBA, you, you got three stars on the team that's got every, all of those guys got to hold their hand up. He said, it's orchestration. The same as for like the NBA or for, yeah. for football. Everybody's got a job to do. Mm -hmm. He says, I'll shoot the three. You be Dennis Rodman. You get the rebound. Shoot, mm -hmm. throw it out to me. He said, Dennis was one of the great uh, 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 rebounders. And he said, mm -hmm. everybody had a role to play. Mm -hmm. And that's what made the Bulls great in that era of Michael Jackson and Scottie Pippen and all of them. And Prince loved to make uh, basketball uh, analogies because he loved basketball. That was one of his favorite sports, his yeah. favorite sport for sure. And so, he made the analogies because when you talk about championship teams, you're looking at the same thing with a band. It's all about how everybody plays their part. You know, Barbarella is the soloist. I'm not a great soloist. You know, that's not my thing. I play parts and I can put stuff together, tech, I can do that. And he, he played on those strengths, like the organ. He knew that I was a church dude. So he says, he told me when he, when he had that plexiglass Hammond built, he said, I got, it, I got, I got something for you. And he mm -hmm. takes me in the studio seat and he turns on the lights. Uh, uh, well, and, and this organ is there with these lights, and I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> crazy organ, this plexiglass, and this Leslie, and it's just like he said, they're gonna be frightened to see us when we come in, and, and I was just like, wow, and it's just like that's your that's your ax now, you're the organ man, and mm -hmm. so that he just used your strength, he just used the thing that you were good at, and he it, and he knew how to like dictate to everybody like okay this is what you're gonna do and i was comfortable in my in my role tommy can take all the solos for days so that dude got chops he got chops he's gonna play you know mm -hmm. and i'm mm -hmm. cool with that i don't gotta do no solos man i just like yeah it's cool on occasion but i'm not tripping about it i'm not mad if i don't get a solo it's just like no it's cool i'm glad when it all sounds great and if it all sounds great then i've done my job i've done what i'm supposed to be there to, to do it's, it's it's the experience of the user on the other end 
of what we're doing is what we're concerned about. That's why Prince hated mistakes so much. Mm -hmm. Prince hated mistakes because he felt like if people are going to stand in line, they're going to pay all this money, the least we can do is do the best we can do for these people mm -hmm. who come out to hear us. Bad notes, things mean you don't practice and you don't you don't respect the fact that these people paid their money and you're making a bunch of mistakes. So we rehearse so that these people get a great show and they're entertained. And so that's what he was about, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And working side by side with him, I'm sure you also developed a very deep friendship. And yeah. you have described Prince as an artist. How would you describe Prince as a person and as a friend? Well, as a person, Prince was a, he was a very unique cat. I never met anybody like Prince, you know. <laughs> and what you have to think about when anybody is, we are forged out of what we grew up with, uh, what we have had to deal with. In life, a lot of people are shaped by their their environment and by what happened to them. And a, and a clearly, a lot of stuff had happened to Prince. You know, he was bullied in school, mm -hmm. made fun of. You know, he had some problems at home. He had a lot of things that he had to overcome in order to become who he was. And I remember he used to talk to me about some of that stuff. He used to tell me about you know how his, his stepdad would put him in the closet and and how you know. And I remember he told me one time about that happening uh when, and then right before that uh, uh we were talking about that and he did this song called papa and mm -hmm. uh but he was telling me about it and he said yeah man he, he used to put me in the closet he had me go pick dandelions out of the yard uh, just uh just stuff to just make me be out away and and he, and he said and he, and he said and that guy he said he, he had the nerve to ask me for a job i said well i said prince we had this big giant window like in this office I looked out in the yard. I said, Prince, you see all those dandelions out there? Let him come over here and pick them dandelions. And Prince just fell out laughing, just like he fell out laughing. And I remember telling him one time when he was talking about how people used to do them in school. I said, well, you know what, Prince? Funny thing is, everybody that I come across in this town, when I'm talking about anybody, anybody going to tell their Prince story. Everybody loves you. Everybody went to school with you. You know, now that you're the man, everybody loves the hero. And everybody like, yeah, me and Prince, we were cool back in the day. We used to go to school together. And I said, I heard you used to beat him up. Oh, yeah, well, that was that. But yeah, but Prince is dope. And so it was always this thing yeah. of like, I always was like very grateful to be here, to be where I was with Prince. And I always made sure to remind him that like, hey, man, it don't matter what any of those people said or did back then. Look at you now, bro. You're a superstar. You the man. Everybody want to be you or be like you. So, so who cares what happened? It's all water under the bridge. It's like it's all good, man. And I'm just, you know, and so it so it just was like, as a person, I know he went through a lot of stuff and he overcame a lot of stuff, and it bothered him about some of that stuff sometimes. And I just was always from the place of like, you know what, bro? It's, who cares? It's like I remember when we did Face Down. Uh, you know, like he didn't really talk about critical reviews and stuff that much but this one kind of got under his skin a little bit and, and it was just kind of like like man look at this man what this guy wrote about him and then i and i just went on a cussing tirade and just like man f that man he can kiss our butt and blah 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 and we were laughing and the next thing you know two days later he says uh, let me play this song for you and it's face down and it's all the stuff that i had said about you know about all these people yeah. and it was it was incredible start to finish in two days And it was a crazy song. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I was floored. I was like, wow. He just took all of my custom and made it into a song. Yeah. And it was just like incredible. But that's what he could do. He was a prolific genius when it came to him writing, how he could shape events and things that happened to him in his life, sacrifice the victory. He talks about epileptic until he was seven years old. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that he used to deal with. And they, he would have these seizures in school and stuff. Yeah. People were like, oh, he's weird. And he's got a big head. And he's this, that, and the other. And it was all of this stuff. He told me he hated school. Only thing about school he liked was basketball. Mm -hmm. But he hated it. And that's because Prince was operating, even as a kid, on a different frequency than everybody else. It's like I was in class with a genius one time in my school. And we thought he was all, you know, kids are, you know, kids are silly. The kids can do some very cruel things. We thought he was just like, he was like, oh, this kid's an idiot. You know, you don't know. Turns out he is Mensa level smart. Mm -hmm. He's in a classroom full of idiots, the rest of us. And he was <laughs> so far ahead, he was bored. 
he had nothing. It was just like, this is like, bro, I'm sitting here counting rocks. Mm -hmm. And and they came and got him and he went to like, left sixth, seventh grade and went to like university somewhere studying like nuclear physics. I mean, like this kid was a genius. And it's yeah. because he wasn't the one that was slow. We were. <laughs> and that's the thing with Prince. You know, he was operating even as a kid. I saw this video of him when he was a kid about yes. talking about the teachers and everything. It was incredible for me to see that. Yeah, because yeah, Because yeah. I was like, oh, my God, that is him. Yeah. Man, that's him. It was fantastic, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. It blew me away because. You know, I knew, only knew Prince as he was an old, was he was a you know a guy already in the game. I never knew him until a lot of my bandmates they grew up with Prince. They knew Prince back in the yeah. day over north, yeah. and they knew all of this stuff. I didn't know any of that, and so when I saw that tape, I was like, "Oh my God, it looks like him, and it talks like him." And it's <laughs> like you know, like I'm like, "Holy cow!" He was even then he was like, "Yeah, we mm -hmm. want him to." You know, the teachers deserve more money to do. <laughs> he was a philanthropist even then. Yeah. Mm, yes. And I was like, oh, my God, yeah. this is incredible. Yeah. It was like destiny. This man was meant for greatness. He was meant for what he was going to be. Even as a kid, he had that same Prince swagger. He just the way he carried himself on television. He mm. was just cool. Mm -hmm. And it was crazy. I was like, wow. Yes. You know, everybody sent me that clip. And I just was like, holy cow, look at this thing, man. This is amazing. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay, you say before Exodus, but is there anything in the vault that hasn't been released yet and that you love to see oh, yeah. published in the near future? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a lot in the vault, man. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's so much in the vault that I don't even know about. <laughs> uh, it's the stuff that I know about and then the stuff that was before me and in, after me. So the vault had gotten so full I used to go in the vault to collect tapes to, to, so I could get my samples and stuff. So I'd go down there and grab a bunch of stuff that I needed and get an engineer. And then I would just take my samples and, you know, do my thing with my stuff. But I would, when I would go in there, I'd look at all of the tapes and all of the names, Miles Davis, uh, uh, you know, Patti LaBelle, like all of these different people that there was tapes. And I was like, man, this is bananas. Just like, <laughs> I just be, get, like, get thrown off just reading tape labels. You know, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, man, this is cool. You know, and I'm looking on and it's floor to ceiling. Tapes are up stacked on top of each other's floor. There's tapes sitting on them. You can't even walk. They're not, there's not enough shelf space. He needed a double wide vault. He needed one much bigger than the one that he had. <laughs> and it was just music everywhere. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff in the vault. Uh, there's a lot of different takes of things in the vault. Uh, I'm hoping that the estate, uh, now that, you know, the family's in control. Mm -hmm. I think things are going to be a little bit different, uh, and I'm I'm hoping so. And I and I believe they're going to do the right thing when it comes to the music. I think a lot, you know, I, I certainly would only want things represented in its best possible light because that's what Prince would have wanted. Things yeah. represented in its best light. That's and it. so if they're going to put out something, I just hope that it's well mm -hmm. done. It's like it's it, that it, it represents him because that's the way he wanted it. He wanted it well done. Anything that he did, he didn't want nothing half-ass. He didn't want it like you know. He wanted it nice and he wanted it great because he said, once you put it in the ether, it's out there. It's mm -hmm. in the ether, you know? So that was his wish. And I, and I, hopefully everyone will comply with, 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 what is uh, his wishes. But even that being said, <laughs> you ain't going to find a whole lot of print stuff. That's terrible in the first place. You're not going to find a whole lot of that anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, that being said, I mean, it's like Prince bad day, whoops a lot of people's best days uh, yes. uh, quite a bit you know mm -hmm. it's still greater than a lot of people's best days yeah. so that's how that goes you know mm -hmm. um what is the song or album you made with prince that make you feel more proud of man tough question it's, it's, I'm, 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 I'm gonna put it like this there's three records four four records Out of all the stuff that I work on that really make me feel proud. Number one is Come because that was the first Prince album. I did uh, Gold Nigga, we did, uh, but that was like an MPG kind of band record. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was my first record I worked on. But Come was like, I always wanted to make a record that had Prince written on the label, like Prince. And then on the back, Morris, Mr. Hayes, Sonny T, Michael Barbarella. 
you know, that was my dream to have that happen. And come was that record. And dark was a song that I got to play on. That it was like that 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 you, you, you got to hear the organ, the organ yeah. like that. And Prince just let me do my thing. And I love dark is one of my favorite songs because yeah. he just Beautiful. let us do our thing. And and it and it feels like that. It feels like churchy, kind of. Mm. But the way that he did his vocals and the horn arrangement, and he let me do some lines that he had the horns repeat. Da, 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 da. Just like it's it's a line that I play. It's crazy. Let's see. Uh, oh. Uh, uh, Da, 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 da. And he had the horn, so he said the horn play that line more. So it's like, and it was like, oh my god, that's like I was like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yes. you know, because it's crazy because you 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 got this situation to where it's like, uh, uh, <laughs> and he just did that, and it's just like I was like, oh, I'm. I, Put me in the ground now. I'm dead. I'm good. I'm okay. That record was great. The gold experience was like amazing to me. I thought it was one of the great records that Prince did that got not the the the, the, the credit and accolades that it deserved. I think a lot of people thought, but it was a great great record to me. Uh, Shush and some of the stuff that he did on that Michael Bland is incredible. The gold experience mix. The drums are just like, just Tom Tucker just murdered this record. It was amazing yeah. sonically. Mm -hmm. You know, the songs were cool and sonically it was a great sounding album. Mm -hmm. And and Tom Tucker and, and Ricky Peterson did a, a great job on that mm -hmm. record. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other one was uh, that, 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 that I was just like, man, Exodus is Exodus. like, mm -hmm. I mean, what can you say? It's a cult classic to me. Exodus is just because of the way it was made and then the songs and and Sonny T really you know a long time Prince friend stepping up and doing some stuff. Exodus is one of my favorite records, but the one that I'm I'm really proud of is is of course uh, Welcome to America. Mm -hmm. It's like Prince called me and just said, "Hey man, I want you to co-produce this record." And sure. and when he when we sit in the car and listen to it, and I just was like listening and going through it and just going like, "Wow!" And just what he was talking about and. You know, people are like, well, Prince is apolitical. He's like, I'm like, bro, welcome to America. Really, he's apolitical? Like this dude is talking about some serious shit right now. He's talking about some some stuff on this record, mm -hmm. and for him to let me take it home and work on it and bring it back and everything is like, pow, pow. He loved it, love it, love it. Like, oh my God, Morris, I love it, love it. Mm -hmm. That was like for me, and to see my name in a co-producer's role like that it was like, I'm like, wow. So for me, it was incredible, you know, and, and I'm very proud of all the work that I was able to be a part of. With it. But, but those records stand out to me for, for those reasons. And um, I'm just honored to, to, you know, man, Prince has access to the best musicians in the world, man. Greg Fillingaines wanted to play with us, you know, mm. one of my one of my personal favorites, one of my yes. heroes, mm -hmm. you know, and Prince was like, I got you. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not Greg Fillingaines, bro. <laughs> I'm not like, you know, but it's just like, Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I I just say that I'm 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 deeply honored and I'm glad that I uh, had the opportunity to do what I did uh, in sure. that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems it seems that Netflix is preparing a documentary about Prince. Mm -hmm. Someone says. Yeah. And we know nothing about it. Do you have any information about it? Anything that well, you could share? Well, I can, I can only share that um, um, they are doing, a, a, you know, there was, it was talked about that Ava DuVernay was going to do this thing. It was why they reported that she was going to be in it. She, I guess, got busy and, and, and they got another mm. gentleman to do it that did the OJ piece. Mm. And uh, and he's great too, and um, so I think something is definitely for sure forthcoming with regard to that. I don't really have any details about uh, okay. who's all in it, and who you know when it's going to be out, anything like that. I do know that there's something in the works uh, along that along those lines, and so uh, I think we all gonna find out what it's gonna do here shortly. So. Uh, 
that's that's about as much as I can say about it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hope it releases soon. And what's what? Which is, in your opinion, the best legacy that Prince left us, and why has been so important for for the world? Well, there, there's a there's a lot that that Prince has left as a, for a legacy. It's, it's it's too much for me to number in this conversation. Yeah. But I think I think one of the most important things that Prince was about was about ownership, about you know. Uh, If you do the work, you should reap the rewards of your work. Uh, he said, own your publishing, own your rights. And he always wanted to empower people, mm-hmm. empower artists. You know, that was a big thing for him. You know, I, I want to empower these artists to, 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 to do better by the, uh, about themselves. And, you know, and, and any chance that he got, I was at so many parties with Prince that he and I would go to And it'd be like these people like Benny Medina and and uh, uh, Jimmy Iovine and all of those people would be at these party, Clive Davis. I've seen Prince tear up more record industry people than I can count. And I always mm-hmm. just came away so proud because Prince would speak, you know, uh, 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 criticism to power. He would speak to power and, uh, and put them in check. I don't care who, he wasn't afraid of any of them. Mm-hmm. Not a one of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, and would say his piece. I learned so much just listening to how he would speak with these people that everybody else would be on their knee, hands and knees, kissing their shoes. And Prince was like, yeah, I'm not having it, bro. I watched him at a party with Jimmy Iovine, just said, Jimmy, would you make your kid sign this contract you got Will I Am in? While Will I Am is sitting right there. And Jimmy's like, Prince, we had a party. We're having a good time. You're breaking my balls, man. Like, like it's like, We have, he said, would you, Jimmy Iovine, have your kids sign the contract you have Will I Am sign? <laughs> Finally, Jimmy said, no. Thank okay. you, Jimmy. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and he's like, you're killing me, Prince. You're killing me. It's like, and Prince would do that, even at a party, mm-hmm. because it was important for him to speak truth to power and say, if you don't make your own kids sign it, why would you make him sign it? And uh, That's all I'm saying. Prince would do that. He was a vanguard in a lot of ways, and he was a freedom fighter in a lot of ways because of what he learned, because of what happened to him, and what he wanted to have happen to other people as a result of that. Mm-hmm. So instead of him just like doing his thing, keeping it to himself, he would go to other artists and say, "Take control of your ownership. Do this. Do that. Do this. And mm-hmm. you don't have to. Do- I've done a lot of this for you. Uh, so take the take what I've done and use it to your benefit. That's what he would mm-hmm. do." He left the legacy of music that 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 overstands that uh, everything mm-hmm. is that it's so much information in the songs because no matter what you think about the music era and I like the sound of the Purple Rain I like the sound of the NPG if you strip away all of the music from all of the eras and just read Prince's mm-hmm. lyrics yeah. mm-hmm. if you just do that there's a consistent thread that runs all through his music. Yeah. yeah, all through the all through his lyrics, and mm-hmm. I asked him one time. I said, "Prince, what do you think you're the best at, man? Like you can do a lot of stuff." I said, "What do you think you're the best at?" And he said, "He did this thing where he looks in the sky like this. He goes, he says, I, he says at the end of the day, Morris. He says I'm a songwriter, and he said I I love poetry and nobody reads poetry anymore. He says and and he said, but I think, and I said, you know what, Prince, I agree 100. I said mm-hmm. I agree 100. As bad as you are on guitar, as great a singer you are, as great as you are on drums and bass, I totally think the best thing you do is lyrics. And he, mm-hmm. and he said it. I got it from the from the from the butter from the duck himself. I got it from him. Mm-hmm. And he said, "I'm a songwriter. At the end of the mm-hmm. day, I'm a songwriter." And and that's the truth. And that's what I take away from it too. I said, "Yeah, I see." I I said, "Prince, I agree 100%. percent, mm-hmm. 100%. percent." Peel up. I, I implore anybody listening to me. That's all you have to do. Take the music away and just read the lyrics. You can do it online and just look up the lyrics. And when you read those lyrics, he's going always. I don't care what the song is. He's going to find a clever way to say what he got to say. Yeah. Every time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every time. So, Morris, 
what are your professional plans for the near f future? Is the NPG touring soon? And by the way, well, we got a few uh, dates coming up. We, mm -hmm. we have a few dates coming. Like we have a, a, a Arizona coming up, Toronto. We'll be in yeah. Ireland in uh, October. And beyond that, you know, uh, we have a license, of course, to use the, the the name the NPG, just like Morris Day has a license in the mm. Revolution. Anybody using any print stuff has to have a license in order to use uh, print uh, estate. Mm -hmm. Basically, all of that belongs to the estate. And so, hopefully, uh, when we go to the estate and see if we can uh, uh, continue to use the name, that's the meeting we have to have with the estate, and and that we do with that. If they de if they deem it okay for us to do that, then you'll see more of the NPG. I'm sure whatever they do, they you know they'll they'll figure it out what they should do. Um, beyond that, uh, I want to get into the podcast thing, and and you know I've learned a lot, and and one thing I can do as you can see that I can do very well is I can run my mouth. I, I talk a lot, and so uh, I feel like uh, I'm a funny guy, and I, and I think I could do a podcast. I hear other people's sure. podcasts, and I say I could do that. I, I know a lot, I've experienced a lot, and I can teach a lot I, from what I've learned. Uh, and I think that's what Prince probably would end up being as a teacher and, I, mm -hmm. and you know doing things more like things like that. And I told him so, I said, Prince, you you should do virtual teaching. Like I was mm -hmm. telling him about a platform I was working with. And I just said, you should do virtual teaching. Like all of these kids can come into a virtual room and you, you show them what you know. I said, because you're a freaking genius. People like you are very much rare, you know? And so I think that's something I would like. I, of course, I, I, I love writing music. Uh, I'm not as prolific as Prince, but I want to do that. And I, I want to dabble in film score. And I've, I've done a film before and work with this gentleman, Alfred Koch, out of Australia on a really cool film. And I got very high up at, at, in Sri Lanka to, to the final four of their Sri Lankan Oscars for one film, that I, the first film that I did. So that's mm -hmm. pretty cool. And mm -hmm. I'd like to do some more of that kind of thing. And, and so... You know, man, I, I think there's a lot on the horizon for me that I can do. Even as a senior in the music business, you know, I can, <laughs> I, there's still some stuff I can do and, and play. And I want to help new bands. I want to help people that want to start out and do what I did. You know what I'm saying? And I, Because I think everyone should experience what I experienced if you can. And, mm -hmm. and I'm here to tell you, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> and that's, my, that's what I want to convey to anybody listening out there that has a dream. You can do it. If you put your mind to it, you can do it and, uh, and, and stay the course. And don't let nobody tell you uh, to defer your dreams or that you can't do what you, 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 you say you want to do. The only thing to stop you is you. Mm -hmm. sounds, sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we are looking forward to to having uh, the MPG in Spain. So let, let's. I hope. was gonna say, like, what's up, Spain? Don't you, you don't love me no more, <laughs> Spain? What's up? <laughs> like, like we can't play in Spain. <laughs> Mackenzie is out of sight, so I want everybody in Spain to know. Talk to your promoters. The MPG would love, love. I love Spain. They told me back when I first joined the band. I think Levi, one of them, told me. Somebody told me. He said, don't get married until you go to Spain. And I said, why is that? And then I went to Spain. I said, okay, I know why. <laughs> don't get married until you go to Spain. Oh, my God. It's amazing in this place. So, yeah, we would love to come back and play. And uh, the people of Spain, we did some, some of the most incredible tours we did. We played in a lot of bullfight rings. And we mm -hmm. played in a lot of places in Spain. We, you know, we did some stuff uh, all over the place. And so mm -hmm. it was very, very cool. Uh, Madrid was amazing. Barcelona, man, I, just phenomenal. So <laughs> we, we 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 would absolutely be happy to come to Spain. And like I said, Mackenzie is amazing. You, you, nobody will ever be Prince. Don't you know? So don't even think yeah. about that. Nobody can be that. But this guy does very well. And uh, and the band is still it's the same guys. Me and Sonny and Tony M. And hey, we still do what we do. Mm -hmm. Tony sound like Tony. Sonny sound like Sonny. Mr. Hayes sound like Mr. Hayes. So it's going to be good. Cool. You know, Mike Scott, Levi, they all sound like Mike Scott and Levi. So mm -hmm. we play the same music, man. It's us. It's mm -hmm. just minus Prince. But mm -hmm. it's just like it's great music. The music stands for itself. And we're just happy to, 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 to be there. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very Thank much, you very Maurice. Much. Maurice. It's been a, a complete honor and a pleasure talking mm. to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Much yeah. love. Take care. Take care. Love. Thank you.
Bye. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.